Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this year's annual Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. To remind you, this lecture was created in honour of the memory of Lord Mackenzie Stewart, who was the first um, a Scottish advocate, then a Scottish judge, and then the first UK judge at the European Court of Justice. And his achievement was to secure the legal integration of the UK into the EC as it then was. When the UK joined the EC, a lot of woe sayers predicted marrying a common law system with a civil law system can never work. And with Jean-Pierre Warner, the first British Advocate General, he had the daunting responsibility of showing that it could. And between them, they did. And it was accepted by everybody that it was done with complete success, to the extent that Mackenzie Stewart became President of the Court in 1984, a post he held until his retirement in 1988. And in an obituary, Lord Cameron of Loch Broom said his work as a judge of the Court of Justice was marked by his deeply held convictions about the way forward in Europe, derived not only from his wartime experiences, but also from his sense of a legal and historical communion between the law of Scotland and the other European systems of law. He started his life as an engineer, and one of his jobs was building bridges during the wartime, and he's remembered as a bridge builder in a double sense, a builder of mechanical ones initially, and then at a public level, a bridge builder between the UK and Europe, and at a private level between himself and his family and their many friends. And we're very glad to welcome tonight three members of his family, um, Judy Mackenzie Stewart, Amanda Hay and Mariana Hay, as representatives of the family. Were he here, we would also like to welcome James Weber, representative of Sherman and Sterling, who are generous enough to sponsor the lecture. And I was looking forward to saying to him, we look forward to eating the dinner you're paying for tonight, but unfortunately he's had to pull out, so I can't say that. <laughs> Our distinguished speaker tonight is Judge Nicholas Forward. He is a Cambridge man, and like Mackenzie Stewart, he started his time as an engineer, reading the fast-track engineering course and then changing to law with a view to going to the bar, which he did in 1970. He practiced in the bar in London between 1971 and 1979, and then in Brussels, in the Brussels part of Brick Court Chambers from 1979 to 1999, with many other highly distinguished people, including Jonathan Sumption, who was here earlier in the week telling us how we're wasting our time running law schools, as the <laughs> faculty members who were present at his lecture will remember. Um, Nicholas Forward was a QC in 1987 and was made a judge of the Court of First Instance, as it was then called, and the General Court, as it's now called, in 1999, where he's been since. He's a bencher of the Middle Temple, among, and among many other distinguished positions, he is a member of the governing body of the World Trade Organization. And I also believe he is a member of the Irish Bar, but I'm not quite sure why he did that. Maybe he'll tell us over dinner. <laughs> He's part of the Cambridge Three, the three key people in the court system at Luxembourg, the judge of the uh, court court and the judge of the General Court and the Advocate General are all Cambridge people, I'm proud to say, and of none of the three are we more proud than Nicholas. He's been a good friend to Cambridge for many years and a good friend to Sells, 
and he's also a personal friend of mine, and his wife is a personal friend since undergraduate days of my wife, so it's a great personal as well as a professional pleasure to welcome him here tonight. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the disadvantages of being introduced for a lecture by someone who uh, I have known, or more to the point, who has known me for as long as John has, is that you are waiting there in trepidation <laughs> to hear what he's going to say. Uh, I think, by and large, I've got away quite lightly. Uh, I'm immensely pleased uh, to be able to give this lecture uh, today. Um, uh, I little thought when I was uh, doing the part two law tripos, uh, trying as far as I could to qualify for the bar exams as quickly as possible, uh, that anything like this could happen to me. Uh, at that stage, we weren't even members of the European Economic Community. Uh, European law figured nowhere, as I recall it, either in the undergraduate or, let alone, I think, even the, the master's courses available at that time. And Europe was a long way away and a distant dream. The theme of my lecture tonight, or any of it, the, the subtitle that I've given it is Interesting Times, Chinese Curses, Lawyers' Headaches, Political Nightmares, and New Dawns. These are, on any view, interesting times. Not, perhaps one hopes, in the sense of the mythical Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. I say mythical because, of course, like any sound lawyer, I've done my research on Google, uh, from whence I find that uh, apparently Chinese scholars have been able to find any uh, Chinese uh, expression that corresponds to it. The origin appears to have been the British ambassador in China in 1936 and 1937 uh, uh, reporting back to uh, the then Prime Minister uh, in some correspondence. And uh, given that the, uh, that was just about the time of the Japanese invasion of China, uh, it's clear the sort of um, interesting times that he had in mind. Of course, it's not in that sense that the times are interesting, but rather, as I will be talking about in the course of uh, my talk this evening, in the sense of wholly unprecedented situations, which, while they present particular interest to lawyers, and possibly even nightmares for certain politicians, could lead to a new dawn for the United Kingdom, both possibly internally, or I might even say existentially, and perhaps as the theme of my talk this evening, in its relation with Europe. We now have, of course, the prospect in the UK over the coming few years of an unprecedented series of events of an undeniably constitutional later nature, that, I think, is the only adjective that can properly be used, even in the absence of a written UK constitution, to describe some of the changes uh, which, if affected, may fundamentally affect the rights and freedoms of all UK citizens and, indeed, UK residents of all, new, uh, all the nationalities. <laughs> indeed, they could even put in issue the continued existence of the United Kingdom in its own right and as a member state of the EU. Each of these events differs in its political origins and legal framework. They share, however, a number of common features. The three events which I have in mind are, of course, firstly, the decision whether to exercise the option negotiated by the previous Labour government and now contained in Protocol 36 to the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union of opting out of up to 136 measures in the field of police cooperation and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, to which the United Kingdom has already once opted in when these measures were adopted. Any such opt-out decision is to be taken and communicated to the, by the Council by the 1st of June 2014. The second event, and you'll, it is arguably in ascending importance, 
is the referendum on Scottish independence, scheduled for the second half of next year. And the third, of course, the promised referendum in late 2017 for the whole of the United Kingdom, however it may then be constituted, on the issue of whether or not the UK should remain in the European Union. I will leave aside for this evening at least such relatively minor matters as the European parliamentary elections in May 2014, the general election of 2015, and any further referenda that may be required under the European Union Act in the event of further treaty revisions. When I was first asked to give this lecture, I was pressed to give the organisers a title. The title, of course, implies a subject, and uh, if anyone who knows me uh, knows me well enough, uh, I tend to leave these things to the last minute. But as the shape of my talk this evening became clearer, a, a slightly racier subtitle uh, it possibly emerged in the form of the words of the Hokey Cokey song, In Out, In Out, Shake It All About. <laughs> Certainly, whatever else may be achieved, there is likely to be a shake-up of Britain's attitude to Europe, even if it remains to be seen how far the Prime Minister will also achieve his stated objective of a shake-up of Europe itself. In passing in that connection, it must be said that there are already some encouraging signs, not merely the various expressions from different countries, both within and without uh, the European Union, uh, but as an example only last week that the German president called on the United Kingdom to remain within the EU and is even, at least in some reports, uh, supposed to have called for English to become the sole working language for the EU institutions. Uh, whether that will convince all member states uh, with quite the same power I, uh, remains to be seen. But let us now return to the UK. What do these three events have in common? The first common feature, as I see it, is that the outcome of each of these events may depend in no small part on the outcome of the negotiations with other parties that may take place between now and the moment when the decision has to be taken, which could improve the present status quo. And that, certainly, is the Prime Minister's stated intention in his speech last month when he announced his intention of getting changes to the EU uh, that would enable him to recommend staying within the Union. Perhaps no less important in all the, these three cases is the common element of there being considerable room for an improved understanding by those who will take the decision as to the true realities of the present situation. In all three cases, at least until recently, the case for the status quo had barely been put. What public discussion there had been was largely driven by those pressing for change. Sometimes, inevitably, it has been said, but on the basis uh, of a false or at least misleading or incomplete prospectus. Only recently has that begun to change. An improved understanding of the realities of the present position, coupled with the possibility of further improvements in the status quo, can only increase the chances that the decision in each case may be to stay in rather than to opt out. There will, of course, be some decision makers, whether parliamentarians and members of government in the case of the Protocol 36 opt out or Scottish or UK voters in the case of the two referenda, whose views are already so certain and unshakable that nothing said between now and then may change their minds. But there will be more, at least we must hope there may be more, whose minds will remain open to clear facts and well-presented arguments. This, of course, presents a particular challenge, and indeed an opportunity, for lawyers not just to take part in, but to inform the debate. I would particularly, therefore, like this evening to pay tribute to the efforts of those, not least uh, Professor John Spencer and his fellow members of the <coughs> Opt Out at Law Camac Uck group, who have worked so hard to clarify the legal issues uh, arising in the context of the proposed collective opt out under Protocol 36. 
I would add here that I've never really understood quite why so much importance has been attached, and indeed was attached, to negotiating the opt-out in 2007. The United Kingdom has always had the possibility of opting in to EU legislation under the old third pillar or choosing not to do so. A good example, perhaps, of how the EU has been able to accommodate a degree of variable geometry uh, within its structure. And that possibility continued after Amsterdam in relation to police cooperation and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, the sort of the slimmed down third pillar, uh, generally now known by the acronym PJCCM. The 136 measures covered by the opt-out are all measures that, as I said earlier, uh, the United Kingdom, after careful consideration at the time, chose to opt into. However, once the United Kingdom did choose to opt into a particular measure, it didn't then have an unrestricted right to choose and apply its own meaning of that measure. Even though the United Kingdom chose not to allow its national courts to make preliminary rulings on questions as to the interpretation of these measures, that did not mean that the Court of Justice had no jurisdiction or competence to interpret them. First, of course, it could do so when a question was referred by a court of one or other member state, most of whom, in fact, had opted into the, uh, proce this procedural mechanism. Any ruling by the Court of Justice on a criminal justice measure could, therefore, clearly not be disregarded by the UK courts when coming to apply the related UK matter. Secondly, the UK was not excluded from the other procedures in Article 35 of the old EU treaty. It could itself bring proceedings to annul any PJCCM measure that it considered was wrongly adopted, even if the UK itself had not opted into it. And it could even be brought before the court as a result of a dispute with another member state as to the interpretation or application of a PJCCM measure. In short, therefore, the jurisdictional opt-out that the UK had for PJCCM matters didn't preclude the court from ruling on such matters, nor did it prevent the UK courts from being effectively bound by such rulings when given. Ironically, all it did and does do was to prevent UK courts from taking part through the preliminary ruling mechanism in the real cooperation that exists between the Court of Justice and national courts. The need for increased clarity and better information on the status quo has now also been recognised in relation to the debate on Scottish independence. The government is, in my view, to be congratulated for having published earlier this month the first in what is promised to be a series of papers in the Scotland Analysis Programme, the first paper being entitled Devolution and the Implications of Scottish Independence. This paper, together with the joint opinion from Professors James Crawford and Alan Boyle, examines in considerable detail some of the issues raised by Scottish independence, both from the perspective of public international law and, of particular importance this evening, that of Scotland's continued membership of the EU. I will come back later both to the paper and to the opinion. The second common feature of my three events, which in some ways is the, the counterpart of the first, is that in each case there will nevertheless remain important uncertainties as to the consequences if the decision to opt out is taken. This is because in each case, the choice to be made will, in essence, between, be a choice between an existing situation, the benefits and disadvantages of which should be reasonably capable of being assessed and discussed, and indeed the situation itself possibly improved, and an entirely new and uncertain situation. This consideration even applies, though perhaps less powerfully, in relation to the Protocol 36 opt-out. Uh, no doubt between now and the 1st of June 2014, 
some of the 136 provisions under the old third pillar may be amended. I think some already have been, and if amended, they're no longer covered by the opt-out, and the UK simply has to decide whether to opt into the measure as amended, and if it does, the Court of Justice will be able to rule on in preliminary ruling requests from British courts as it does with the courts from any other member state. But for the remainder, the opt-out, if exercised, will have to be for all the unamended pre-Lisbon measures still in force. The UK has announced uh, uh, that it is considering the possibility of opting out of all the measures, but then seeking to opt individually back into them. It is, however, faced with a difficulty, and the difficulty is this. The difficulty is that at the moment that the decision to exercise the collective opt-out has to be taken, that's to say shortly before the 1st of June 2014, the UK will have no certainty that it will be able to opt back in, or indeed as to the terms on which they will be able to do so, remembering that the opt-ins might be in relation to and would probably be in relation to certain individual measure, measures. You will find an enlightening analysis of these problems in the pellucid analysis of David Anderson QC, the independent reviewer of ter terrorism legislation, in his evidence to the House of Lords Select Committee, where he refers to European Commissioner Malmström as saying, on each of these opt-ins there will have to be a negotiation, and that of these 136 laws, many are very connected. The UK could therefore be pressured, he suggests, to rejoin some measures it disagreed with in order to retain those that it considers valuable. And in the, particularly in the case of Schengen measures, the requirement of unanimous consent by the member states may result in some member states seeking to impose conditions as the price for their consent. A similar situation applies to the two referenda on Scottish independence and then on continuing UK membership of the European Union. Thus, while the vote for withdrawal may, at least in some sense, enable the voters of uh, Scotland in 2014 or the UK in 2017 to feel in the words of the poet W.E. Henley, that they are the captains of their souls, they will, unfortunately, in no way be masters of their fate. For in both cases, exercising the option to leave will trigger an uncertain process, the results of which, though vital for their future economic prosperity, may be highly unpredictable, not least because they may significantly be dependent on negotiations with a larger and much more economically powerful counterparty that will take place only after the decision has been taken. If that counterparty is, moreover, opposed to the divorce, it will have had no incentive whatever to clarify the desired terms of the divorce settlement in advance of the decision to split nor, having failed to prevent the split, would it thereafter have any incentive to make the financial and economic consequences any more favourable to the departing party than their own self-interest would dictate. Europe may well do favours between now and the referendum to keep the UK in, but it is unlikely to do so if, despite their efforts, the UK decides to leave. This practical impossibility of pre-negotiation on opt-out terms is, in the case of Scotland, well illustrated in the first Scotland analysis paper. There, in relation to the purely internal situation that will arise in relation to uh, the relationships between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, the first paper says the following. Both governments agree that there can be no pre-negotiations on what the terms of independence might be before the referendum takes place. 
For the United Kingdom government's part, this is because of a profoundly important principle arising from the fact that the UK government is one of Scotland's two governments. UK government ministers represent the whole of the UK, including Scotland, and serve the interests of all of its citizens. As such, the UK government has this responsibility in many areas. Later on, they say, until the outcome of the referendum is known, neither the UK government nor the Scottish government has a mandate to carry out these negotiations. For the UK government, it would mean abrogating its uh, uh, responsibilities as part of the government of Scotland. And for the Scottish government, it would mean assuming positions on reserve matters that are the responsibility of the UK government without any mandate to do so. As the Secretary of State for Scotland has said, it is for that reason that the UK government cannot, in good faith, plan for or hold negotiations before the referendum. To do so would start unpicking the fabric of the United Kingdom before people in Scotland had exercised their democratic right to choose whether to remain part of it or not. In other words, there will not, and even cannot be, any pre-negotiations that could provide assurances as to the terms of a divorce settlement between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Would-be voters for whom these terms might be important will therefore have to rely on blind faith. That said, the paper at least does provide some assurances. At point 230, it is stressed that the negotiations, when undertaken, that's to say after the, uh, a, a, a no vote or a leave the, UK, leave the UK vote, would be entered into in good faith, with a view to giving effect to the expressed wish of the people of Scotland. But as it also explains, the process would be extremely complex, would take a long time both domestically and, in the present context, in relation to Scotland's position in relation to the EU. And it is this last aspect which I now wish to address. I don't know how legible that is, but I'm trying to fit it all on one seat. Ten years ago, in the Convention on a European Constitution for Europe, <coughs> relatively little attention was paid <coughs> to the detail of the wording of what has now become Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. <coughs> for many, the inclusion of a formal mechanism enabling a member state to exit the European Union was no more than a sensible tidying up exercise doing little more than providing a pre-agreed framework for an exit route, the existence of which was arguably implicit already under public international law. It was thought unlikely ever to be needed. Indeed, at that time, member states were queuing up to join, or would-be member states were queuing up to join. Jean-Victor Louis has explained the motive as being largely that of satisfying Eurosceptics, or at least, to use his words, Souveraniste. Giscard d'Estaing explained that there can be no marriage without the possibility of divorce, and that's a typically French idea. <laughs> uh, and Professor Alan Dashwood, uh, unfortunately not here this evening, otherwise I would have been very interested to hear any observations that he said, uh, having been part of the UK team in the convention, may it be better placed than I to tell the full story. But the incorporation of an explicit exit procedure provided at least further confirmation that whatever the ever closer union invoked in successive EC treaty recitals since 1957 may lead to, it is a union that necessarily presupposes the continued existence of member states agreeing together to share their sovereignty within pre-agreed limits for common purposes and for their mutual benefit. Article 50, which you see up there, of course, only at least possibly on its face would appear to deal expressly with the situation of when a member state as a whole wishes to leave the European Union. But I believe that careful consideration of that case of total departure also provides valuable guidance as to what should happen when part of a member state seeks its independence. 
Let me, however, deal first with the situation of total withdrawal. At the political level, the Article 50 procedure suffers from the same basic problem as that for Scottish independence. When the Scottish vote is taken, voters will, as I've suggested earlier, have little idea of what independence may involve, uh, in particular, what would be the terms of the divorce settlement, what would happen to the armed forces, what would happen to the national debt, what would happen to currency, and so on. But in one important respect, the situation in relation to leaving the EU, as the UK leaving the EU, may be even worse. A Scottish vote for independence might well be, and has been expressed to be, politically binding, but it will not be legally binding. It will always be possible for the voters in Scotland, once the negotiated terms have become clear, to change their minds once they see the terms of the settlement and before the final legal steps to create an independent state are taken. The situation under Article 50, however, may be rather different. Reading the provisions there, Article Paragraph 1, any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Two, a member state which decides to withdraw shall notify the Council of its intention. In the light of the guidelines provided by the Council, the Union shall negotiate and conclude an agreement with that state, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. That agreement shall be negotiated in accordance with 218.3 and concluded on behalf of the Union by the Council, acting by a qualified majority after obtaining the consent. And this is the key point. The treaties shall cease to apply to the state in question from the date into entry into force of the withdrawal agreement, assuming that there is one, or failing that, two years after the notification referred to in paragraph two, unless the European Council, in agreement with the member states concerned, unanimously decides to extend this period. And then there are provisions about the voting. Some authors, notably Jean-Victor Louis, consider that once a state gives notice, the process is irrevocable. This follows, inter alia, from the two-year guillotine clause, which, in the absence of an agreement, will automatically bring to an end the application of the treaties in the withdrawing state. In other words, once the train leaves the station, there's no stopping it. There may be the possibility of changing the route by adding terms and laying down the conditions for withdrawal, but the next station will be outside the EU. Let me then now turn for the implications of this in relation to Scottish independence. The joint opinion from Professors James Crawford and Alan Boyle conclude, concludes, and I hardly do it justice in this brief summary, that Scottish independence would create a new state distinct in international law from the rest of the United Kingdom, sometimes referred to as RUK or RUK. But I think I'll try R-U-K, I know Ruck sounds a bit rugby-like. <laughs> uh, the R-U-K would, in all probability, have the status of continuator state of the former UK, and this would mean that, as a general rule, R-U-K would replace the former UK for the purposes of the thousands of treaties and international agreements to which the UK is currently party, and in particular those involving membership of international organisations. Scotland, by contrast, although it could be regarded as a successor state to the former UK, and the professors emphasise that continuator and successor are very different concepts in international law, would have to negotiate its own accession to all these organisations, multilateral treaties and agreements, and in respect to bilateral agreements, would have to negotiate new agreements. No doubt, 
that process would be made easier in many respects by reason of Scotland's present de facto participation in those arrangements as being part of the United Kingdom. Whether or not the outcome of such negotiations would simply be the accession of Scotland on the same or similar terms of the, for, uh, of the former UK is, uh, in, in some cases, perhaps not so clear. Many of these agreements, particularly those involving financial obligations towards the operating and other costs of international organisations, such as the World Bank and IMF, would need specific negotiation, probably in parallel or possibly in parallel with a mirror image renegotiation of the equivalent terms by and in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom. It is therefore understandable that the Scotland analysis paper proposes that, and I quote, future Scotland analysis papers in the series will examine the UK's membership of key international organisations in further depth. That no doubt will be a fruitful source of debate for uh, possible other seminars. But so far as the EU is concerned, Professors Crawford and Boyle look in greater deal, d detail at the legal position. They consider first the position of the uh, uh, RUK and conclude that on the assumption that RUK would be regarded as the continuator state of the former UK, Scottish independence would probably not give rise to automatic termination of the UK's membership of the Union. And in reaching this conclusion, they cite the examples of Algeria's independence in 1962 from metropolitan France and Greenland's withdrawal from the EEC in 1985, whilst, however, still remaining an autonomous country under the Danish crown. They also point to the detailed provisions for withdrawal of a member state in Article 50, TEU. In particular, they pointed to the requirement that before any withdrawal takes effect, there should be detailed negotiations on the consequences of withdrawal, both for the departing state and for the rest of the EU. And they therefore conclude that automatic withdrawal would be inconsistent with the spirit, if not also the letter, of Article 50. This last conclusion must, in my view, clearly be correct. Before Lisbon, the treaties contained no provision for a member state to leave the Union, uh, and there were the, uh, two, uh, only the two instances of Algeria and Greenland. But what has changed since then, however, is not just the introduction of Article 50 TEU, but the degree of integration of the European Union at every level, economic, monetary, social, and political. The internal market is now a reality. Indeed, it's 21 years old this year. Millions of UK, EU citizens have exercised their rights to move from their home countries to other member states, to work, to live, to raise families, to retire and die. Companies have established themselves across the Union, setting up subsidiaries, branches and agencies. Social security rights have become substantially integrated, so that now entitlement to health protection, employment benefits and old age pensions has become entirely transparent both to the nationality of the recipients and also to the EU states where they may have paid their contributions. Marketing authorizations in the internal market are given for medicines, chemicals and other products all by a single European agency. Is it realistic to contemplate for one moment that a situation could be allowed to arise whereby from one day to another existing rights and protections could simply disappear or become effectively valueless? Clearly not. Moreover, many of these interests are essentially bilateral in the sense that the interests of the continuing EU states to ensure effective protection for the social and economic rights of their citizens in the departing state will be mirrored by the desire of the departing state to ensure equivalent protection for its citizens within the territory of the continuing EU. Scotland will be as keen to protect its diaspora in the EU as no doubt Poland will be to protect the, the, uh, the, the, those who moved to Scotland. Article 50 
is therefore, I believe, a recognition of the inevitable. It is now, I believe, at least politically unthinkable that a state could leave the EU without detailed negotiations to assure, ensure that, so far as possible, proper account is taken of pre-existing rights and legitimate expectations, not only of states, but of individuals, and not only of EU citizens, but also, indeed, those who benefit uh, indirectly from uh, those, uh, those who have such rights. And therefore, I believe it's unthinkable that Scottish independence could be finally implemented without negotiations with the remaining EU states and institutions to resolve these institutions. In short, the need to ensure a properly negotiated departure of a member state that wishes to leave the Union is crucial to the analysis of what should happen when part of a member state seeks to become independent. Let me just stay with this point for a moment. Consider first the situation, unlikely perhaps, of Scotland seeking independence on the basis that it did not wish to remain part of the EU. Professors Crawford and Boyle suggest in their opinion that it would be open to the United Kingdom in principle to change the territorial scope of the EU treaties unilaterally by granting Scotland independence, with the result that, and I quote, the treaties would continue to apply to the reduced territory of the RUK, but would on their face cease to apply to an independent Scotland. If, and I stress the if, if that is intended to suggest that there would be no obligation in that situation for the UK to seek to ensure in good faith negotiations with the rest of the EU and to do so before that independence took effect, the protection of the pre-existing rights of EU citizens in Scotland and the reciprocal rights of Scots in the rest of the EU in a similar way to that arising under Article 50 in the event of a total departure, then I must say I would find that hard to accept. The need for good faith negotiations would also seem to accord with the answer of President Barroso last year to a question concerning possible Catalan independence when he said, and I quote, in the hypothetical event of a secession of a part of an EU member state, the solution would have to be found and negotiated within the international legal order. In short, when it comes to the issue of whether or not there is a good faith obligation on the UK in relation to negotiating with the EU the consequences of Scottish independence, I find myself very comfortably in the same camp as Sir David Edward. But whether such a good faith obligation would be achieved through application of Article 50 by an extensive, or some might simply say purposive, interpretation of Article 50 itself, by, whether by analogy or merely under the principle that the greater includes the lesser, or whether it be through an argument based on the Court of Justice's case law on EU citizenship and on Article 20, Paragraph 1 of the TFEU, as Bob Lane uh, has apparently suggested, may ultimately never have to be resolved. Political imperatives can and should render, render the legal question moot. These same considerations apply a fortiori if, as seems more likely, Scotland wishes to remain part of the EU following agreement for a consensual separation. In that situation, while I fully accept that the, Craw the Crawford and Boyle conclusion that Scotland would not seek succeed automatically to EU membership, the obligation on and interests of all parties to negotiate in good faith to bring about the result, a result that ensured the uninterrupted enjoyment of the rights of EU citizens in Scotland and the equivalent rights of Scots in the rest of the EU would seem to be even stronger. Both Scotland and the rest of the EU would have every reason to achieve that result, and the, e and the UK, uh, relying on its commitment to negotiate arrangements in good faith, covering all aspects of the independence, uh, would be expected to comply. That brings me finally to the issue of the UK's promised referendum in late 2017. 
It will not have escaped your attention that many of the remarks that are made in the Scotland analysis paper as to the uncertainties and difficulties that may arise if Scotland leaves the UK will apply mutatis mutandis to the uncertainties and problems for the UK if it would decide to decide to leave the EU. However, in the interests of contributing a little to that debate and in the spirit I mentioned earlier, let me make a number of uh, more legal points with some apologies to those in the audience who are not lawyers. While the idea of an ever closer union is something that has long horrified Eurosceptics, we should not forget that it was present in the opening words of the 1957 EEC Treaty, was there when the UK joined the EEC in 1972 and was repeated at Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice, and now Lisbon. And as to whether that union was merely one of states or also one of peoples, an issue touched on in the Prime Minister's recent speech, which you see up there, we can go back even further to the recitals to the 1952 Coal and Steel Community Treaty, where the original six expressed their resolve to create, by establishing an econo economic community, the basis for a broader and deeper community among peoples long divided by bloody conflicts. And on this issue, this very month, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the court's judgment in Van Ghent and Loos, with its famous declaration that community law is intended to confer upon individuals rights which become part of their legal heritage that arise not only when they're expressly granted by the treaty, but also by reasons of obligations which the treaty imposes in a clearly defined way upon individuals as well upon member states and the institutions of the community. Van Ghent and Loos was, of course, only the first step in a long line of cases concerning the scope of EU law in the legal heritage of the member states. You will all have your favourite examples. Mine include Dufresne, Martinez, Zala and Grzilczyk. In the same spirit of search for clarity and truth, I would also like briefly to comment on the suggestion, which we see there, that the Court of Justice has consistently supported greater centralisation of powers or responsibilities uh, within the community and then with the Union. While such an observation might have reflected an, a, a, more accurately an overall tendency in the case law in the 70s and to a lesser extent in the 80s, <clears throat> one cannot disregard the fact that that situation has changed significantly since the 1990s. I certainly don't mean that the court has abandoned its role as one of the essential engines of integration. The cases on citizenship that I just mentioned above include some of those. Rather, I suggest that the court has regularly demonstrated greater concern for the preservation of the autonomy of member states in its interpretation of the treaties. In other words, there is an increasing number of judgments where the, uh, the court tends to emphasize the principle enshrined in Article 4.1 of the TEU that the union has attributed competences only. One example of that is the famous tobacco uh, direct advertising directive case Germany in Parliament decided in 2000. In that case, the court made it clear that the provisions in the treaties that provide for uh, an approximation of laws in the context of the internal market cannot be used to circumvent and express exclusion of harmonization laid down in the treaties. In that case, Germany had sought annulment of a directive banning all forms of advertising for tobacco products across the whole community. Germany argued that the directive amounted to a harmonizing, uh, the exercise by the community of a harmonizing competence not conferred by the treaty. The directive had been adopted on the basis of the former Article 95 on the basis that it would improve the conditions for the functioning of the internal market. The court, however, held that the Council and Parliament had insufficiently demonstrated that the directive would contribute to a better functioning internal market, though there were certain examples, advertisements in magazines circulating between member states and so on. But in the court's view, the directive's predominant aim was rather to contribute to improving health in the community a field where the treaty excluded uh, this action of approximation by the EU institutions. It's here to, useful to recall the words of the court uh, in answer to an argument uh, 
uh, of the Commission and Council to construe this, the article of the treaty as meaning that it vests in the community legislator a general power to regulate the internal market would be contrary to the principle that the community has con conferred powers only. There are other cases, too, uh, that, that illustrate this, n notably in areas uh, in relation to the free movement of goods and services uh, that concern the, uh, the, the so-called rule of reason. And here, I would mention briefly, but I won't go into it in detail because of time, the court's 2004 judgment in the Omega Spielhallen case. This was a case about um, a, uh, a new electronic uh, game involving laser guns and specific jack uh, jackets, wh which could be used for uh, playing at killing in uh, Omega's laser drone. Uh, the, the equipment had been provided by a, a UK company, but through a franchising agreement. The German uh, police took a, a dim view of this and issued an order prohibiting the playing of the game, considering that the game constituted a danger to public order since the acts of simulated homicide and trivialization of violence thereby engendered were contrary to fundamental values prevailing in public opinion. Omega challenged the order as being an illegal obstacle to the free, its freedom to provide services, and Germany defended the order by referring to the importance of human dignity in the German constitutional order. It was not disputed in the court that the police order had had the effect of interfering with free movement. The issue was whether it was justified. The court, therefore, faced two conflicting values, the free movement principles on one hand, and the interpretation given by a competent authority of a member state of the latter's constitutional values and the other. The problem was essentially one of the definition of how far public policy could go in justifying a derogation to the free movement principles. Earlier case law had held that free movement could be deprived of its substance if member states were able to define unilaterally what public interest covers without any control by the community interests. The court nevertheless found that the specific circumstances which may justify recourse to the concept of public policy may well vary from one country to another and from one era to another, and hence the competent national authorities must be allowed a margin of discretion within the limits laid down by the treaty. And so it eventually upheld the prohibition order, emphasizing not only that the protection of fundamental rights was also one of the objectives of the Union, but it wasn't uh, not, it, but also, and this is the important point, it was not indispensable for the purpose of justifying an interference with free movement on public policy grounds that that public policy ground corresponds to a conception shared by all member states as to the precise way in which the fundamental right or legitimate interest is to be protected. In short, what the court was saying, th there may be unity, but there can be diversity with unity. There are other examples, and I won't go into them in detail, but other examples in the area of common commercial policy since 19, the Opinion 1 of 1994 uh, and later cases where the court has systematically, uh, even in, in an area which uh, involved the, uh, uh, the common commercial policy, which is uh, generally an exclusive competence of, of the community and now the union, uh, it nonetheless held that uh, in relation to various aspects of the GATS agreements relating to certain services and the TRIPS agreement, the WTO agreements uh, are required to be concluded not just by the European Union but by, or community, but also by the member states. And this stricter approach uh, has similarly appeared in the Opinion 2 of 2000 in the Cartagena Protocol and various other measures, opinion one of 2008. <clears throat> Lastly, but not least, I perhaps shouldn't finish this overview of the case law without mentioning the court's willingness to recognize limits to some of its even more controversial rulings. In Ruiz Zambrano, for example, 
Uh, it pronounced on the possible application of EU citizenship rights, especially residence rights under Article 20 TFEU, to so-called purely internal situations. This case has been depicted by many commentators as one where the limits of federalism in the EU were at issue. The court decided in substance that EU citizenship rights could also apply in a purely internal situation, at least where a decision to the contrary, quote, would have the effect of depriving citizens of the Union of the genuine enjoyment of the substance of their rights conferred by virtue of their status as citizens of the Union. Well, leaving inside the, the particular uh, uh, criticisms of that, what is perhaps more relevant is that in more recent cases, the court has made clear that the op window that it opened in Ruiz Zambrano is perhaps to be made available only in very exceptional circumstances. And here, I refer briefly to Derechi, McCarthy, and Leader. All these illustrations provide, in, I would suggest, an objective but admittedly incomplete view of salient features of the court's role in balancing the EU's and member states' interests when interpreting the treaty. At the very least, they would seem to provide specific counterexamples to the picture of a court of justice that has consistently supported greater centralization. So after that legal excursion, let me then uh, close by returning to my theme at the outset and to the challenges of our interesting times. I hope to have given you this evening at least some flavour of the political and legal problems that seem to me to be likely arise in relation to these three constitutional events. I must admit I am not an enthusiast for referenda certainly not for decisions that are economically complex or where voters are likely to be more influenced by the dust and light of battle than by the underlying merits. How many voters are really likely to wish to understand the true nature of the court's case law? And one mustn't forget that all too often referenda are used by voters as an opportunity to give the government of the day a bloody nose, irrespective of their views on the question put. That explanation has often been advanced to explain the vote in France rejecting for the Treaty on the Constitution of Europe. For <clears throat> in the middle of a Westminster parliamentary term, that risk will be present too in 2017 in the UK. But where referenda have become inevitable we nonetheless need to do all we can to ensure the best result is taken for the right reasons. And with a bit of luck, the dawn on that day will be a dawn with sun and not the grey coldness of exclusion somewhere in the middle of the North Sea. <laughs> Thank you very much.